Hello guys, welcome to this webinar. My name is Bashir from Afrinic, and I'll be joined by Jody Palette from the IPv6 company. Jody will be our key presenter. So at the moment, before we begin, just ensure you can hear us. And if you cannot hear us, uh, text in the chat section. Before we begin, I'm, I'm just going to go through some few house rules for the webinar for clarification. In case you have any question, kindly use the Q&A section. So the Q&A section so that the presenter can be able to view all the questions and systematically answer them. Then for any other issue, you can use the chat section. In case you don't hear us or you have audio issues, you can use the chat section and I'll be able to assist. So we can begin and I believe some more people will be joining, but we'll just continue. So I'll just hand over the floor to Jody. Thank you, Bashir. You can hear me? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, just just one, one point. Uh, in order to, 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 to do this uh, uh, more proactive, um, if, if you have any question during my presentation, uh, please do it. Uh, I will try to stop from time to time and answer some questions. Uh, if I don't answer a specific question, it's because I am having already some slides on that, okay? So don't hesitate to do the questions at any time and from time to time, I will respond to them. Uh, if I am missing anything, Bashir, you, you, you tell me, okay? Thank you. Okay. So, uh, what is the goal of this, of this webinar? Uh, basically, um, is a, a, a very brief refresh about what it means transition and coexistence and then looking at what is the actual technologies that in both cellular and broadband networks you should use to get ready for IPv6. Uh, let's get started. So, the, the first thing that, that you need to understand is that when I eat ITF designed uh, IPv6, uh, we need to take a decision about making it compatible with IPv4 and then missing some possible new enhancements or making a new protocol that is not compatible but will have, uh, let's say, some additional advantages. In both cases, even if we don't, if we try to make IPv6 compatible with IPv4, we will need to upgrade networks. So there is not a real advantage trying to keep IPv6 compatible with IPv4. So that's the key decision to go through a new protocol and make sure that we design what we call transition and coexistence techniques. Many people talk about migration. This is broken. Migration don't exist in the sense of IPv6. Migration is when you move a computer with an XP operating system to Windows 10. You don't keep both operating systems running at the same time. That's a migration. It's moving from one to another one without keeping the previous one working at the same time. And this is the main difference between IPv4 uh, transition to IPv6. Uh, so in this case, what we want to make sure is that as much as possible, we avoid breaking things. And this basically means applications, which is what real end users are going to use, are still working even if you deploy IPv6. But initially, at least in the local area networks where the applications are running, you should keep dual stack. And dual stack, in fact, is the first of these, uh, the, the three possible transition uh, mechanism groups, okay? So if you look at ITF documents, you will not find migration technologies. You will find transition and coexistence. Sometimes we use the word migration. That's an editorial need. It's, it's not really correct. We should talk always about transition and coexistence. So again, we have three main ways of doing this transition and coexistence. The first one is the dual stack. 
The second one is tunneling, and the third one is translation. Uh, originally, we expected to use one or the other, but today we need to use some of them in combination. So that's the real thing. We are not just running dual stack, but we are also doing different technologies in different parts of the network. Now, what it means dual stack? I am sure most of you already know, but just in case, very quickly, dual stack means having in parallel IPv4 and IPv6. So again, this ensures that applications, at least applications in local area networks where the users are connected, are still working even if the application don't support IPv6. How the operating system or the application is choosing between v4 or v6, this is done basically by means of DNS. Um, this, this is something that we have done already before. We have been working with other protocols before IP, like Apple Talk, IPX, uh, maybe some of you already have used those protocols and we have been uh, using coexistence already in those cases, okay? So now the big difference is in those cases, there was a specific applications using one or another protocol. In the case of IPv4 or IPv6, the way to do it is using DNS. And what it means or, go, or what is the impact is that if you don't use DNS, you can break things. And there are still unfortunately many applications or application developers that tend to use literal IPv4 addresses. This is really, really, really a big mistake because that means that those applications will not work when you have IPv6 in the network and you decide to start turning off IPv4 because that's the end goal. The end goal is not to have dual stack forever because we don't have IPv4 addresses anymore. So the end goal is to make sure that whatever we do is in the long term uh, thinking in an IPv6 only internet, okay? So that's basically the thing. Now, if you look at, let's say we have three devices. We have one device, which is IPv6 only. That's in the, in the left in your screen. We have one device, which is IPv4 only. And we have another device, which is dual stack. The first thing to consider is that most of the time, Dual stack is not actually dual stack. It's what we call an hybrid stack, okay? Because most of the functionalities in the IPv4 stack are almost the same, and in fact, TCP, UDP is almost the same for both IPv4 and IPv6. So having dual stack don't means that you need double memory for the stack. Usually an IPv4 only stack will take about 30 kilobytes only, People expect that it takes much more, but today they are very, very, very optimized. And having a dual stack or an hybrid stack don't mean double space. It means basically only 10 or 15% more, okay? That's very, very important because in small devices like Internet of Things uh, or smartphones is not a cost in general, but in very, very small, teeny devices, having dual stack will have an impact. So that's the reason a good development or deployment of Internet of Things will be from the start IPv6 only. And in fact, there are only, uh, there is a protocol for Internet of Things, which is called six low pan, which is IPv6 only. It, it's not supporting at all IPv4, okay? Let's suppose in the picture that we have in the screen, that the IPv6 only device that you have at the left is a smartphone. And this smartphone is no longer connected with IPv4, it's only connected with IPv6. This is today a reality, it's not fantasy, okay? In many networks in the world, cellular networks uh, is um, just IPv6 connectivity. And in fact, some vendors like Apple, they only support applications in the App Store that are able to run in IPv6 only scenarios, okay? So if you have an old application with IPv4 only, when you try to upgrade it, 
Apple will tell you, no, I don't allow you to upgrade it and I will actually cancel this application from the App Store because it's not supporting IPv6 only. It's a must today to have IPv6 only support in applications. Uh, now, let's suppose the other device, the IPv4 only device, is a weather sensor in Alaska, okay? Or in the middle of the desert in, in Africa and somewhere. Uh, Nobody is going to go there to replace it, to upgrade with IPv6. Maybe the vendor don't exist anymore, but we have an IPv6 only cellular phone. And we want to talk to this IPv4 only, uh, let's say, weather sensor. So we need to have in the ISP network, which is the box in the middle of the picture, something which is dual stack that is allowing us the communication between IPv6 only and IPv4 only applications. And that's what we call a translator. It's a kind of proxy, a kind of uh, gateway to translate between both protocols, okay? One more reason to run IPv6 only is because it saves battery. This is something that has been explained several times in many presentations. And there is a report from Nokia a few years ago that is explaining that because in IPv4, uh, there is a need for the cellular phone to send keep alive every 30 seconds. It means extra battery consumption and of course uh, processing power and of course radio bandwidth from the operator which is expensive. Okay, so that's one more reason to keep as much as possible IPv6 only because you are saving energy. Uh, and this is not only good for the user of the cellular phone, it's also good for, for the operator which is going to save also a lot of money in terms of energy. Now, the next, the next uh, way of, of, um, of um, the, the next type of, uh, or the next set of uh, transition technologies is tunneling. Again, tunneling is something that we already know. Uh, when we use VPNs, when we use MPLS, all these kind of things are ways of doing tunneling. So in this case, the original idea was we are going to deploy IPv6 before we have exhausted IPv4. So in this case, in order to connect IPv6 islands or devices through ISPs that are still not IPv6 enabled, we need to tunnel IPv6 on top of IPv4 packets. Okay, so that's what you see in this slide. So as you can see here, we have an IPv6 packet to go from this host to that host in the other end. And the idea is that this IPv6 packet, because this network is still not IPv6 ready, we need to append at the beginning of the IPv6 packet an IPv4 header, okay? That's, that's called protocol 41. It's not a port number, it's a protocol number, protocol number 41. This is called six in four, okay? And this is used by many tunnels to transport IPv6 on top of existing IPv4 networks. Now, what is the problem today is that we already run out of IPv4, so in some cases we cannot do this. So what we do is the reverse tunneling. We encapsulate IPv4 on top of IPv6 packets. We will see it later. Okay, translation. I have already explained the translation in the, in the slide with the pictures before. The idea is to make sure that if we have devices which are IPv6 only, they can talk with devices which are IPv4 only. Now, translation is not perfect. You can never do a perfect translation between two languages. So this is the same for two protocols. So the thing is, in fact, a few years ago, we had one of the earlier translation technologies in ITF. It was called NAT-PT. NAT, everybody recognized that word, but PT stands for protocol. So it was translation, translating not just the addresses, but also the protocol. And the problem of NAT-PT was that it, it, the, develop, the original development idea was let's cover the case where I have an IPv4 only website and I have users that are uh, looking at the website from IPv6 networks. 
So having this protocol in front of the IPv4 only web server allows those users to access which IPv6. The problem with that is that is, uh, many, many engineers decided to use NatPT for translating other protocols, not just a website, okay? Not just HTTP. And that started to get broken. So then we invented what we call L ALGs, application layer gateways. And ALGs means that you are getting less and less performance on a NatPT box. So at the end, there were so many broken things that the ITF decided to deprecate, so it's no longer a standard, that translation protocol. So NatPT is no more a valid transla translation protocol. We will talk like, later about what are the right technologies for translating today. Um, one of the things that we did in ITF was trying to look into all the possible scenarios and try to make the best transition mechanism for every possible scenario. And while that's a fantastic idea, the problem is that not, it's not really very useful because it means that every ISP needs to study a lot of protocols and decide which of them need to be deployed in their network. Or even worse, if they need to deploy several of them. And this is a, a complexity that it's, it's, it's really too much. So during the last few years in ITF, we decided we cannot do more transition mechanisms, but we need to consider the new situation where the networks will be IPv6 only. And then we need to make sure that we have the right tools for that specific case. So from, from the rest of this presentation, our focus is trying to look into this IPv6 only transition mechanism. So what, how we call this mechanism? We talk about IPv6 only, which IPv4 as a service, okay? Uh, so IPv4 as a service because we are running IPv4 as a kind of service provided by the operator on top of an IPv6 only network. And again, this is the end goal of the transition today. Now, before going into those protocols, there is something that you need to understand because I am sure there are a lot of vendors trying to sell you this. And this is what we call carrier grade NAT. Carrier grade NAT, the correct wording in ITF terminology is AFTR. You have here in the middle of the cloud, okay? So AFTR stands for Address Family Transition Router, okay? And basically, this technology is a big NAT. That's the reason it's called a carrier gray NAT. It's a technology to keep extending the life of IPv4. It's not a technology to deploy IPv6. So if you have a CPE, the one that we have, the NAT box that we have at the left uh, in, the, in the bottom of the slide. If you have a, CT, a CPE, today the CPE has a public IPv4 address, and when we deploy carrier gray NAT, we have this address into the one part of the carrier gray NAT, of the F, AFTR, okay? So what that means is that this box is no longer actually connected directly to internet. And that means as well that we have one NAT level on the user CPE and another NAT level on the ISP. Now, how we do that? We do that by means of poor sharing. What that means is that if an IPv4 address has 75,000 ports, we will use, for example, 2,000 ports for every customer. So that means that we will have 30 customers using the same IPv4 address. And this is bad for many, many, many reasons. The first one is that with this, you are not deploying IPv6. To, the, the, to deploy IPv6, in addition to the carrier green NAT, you need to use dual stack and replace the CPE. Because most of the time, if you have older CPEs in your network, maybe CPEs that you purchased six or seven years ago, for sure, they will not have support for IPv6, okay? 
So carrying that alone is not the solution. And carrying that has really very bad implications. We will see some of them in the next slides. The first one you see it here, you have two levels of NAT instead of just one. And many applications get broken when you have two levels of NAT. So this is a list of applications that typically get broken when you use carry rain NAT. It's true that for some of them, there are solutions. The solutions means using application layer gateways. But having application layer gateways, you need one for every problem. It means extra cost in the sense that a carry grain net box will have lower performance as much ALGs you are uh, installing in that carry grain net box. Okay? So, for example, if you have a carry grain net box that costs $200,000, you will need to have two at least because you need to have uh, high availability for your customers, right? If the, your carrier in that box get broken, you cannot just tell the customers, wait, I am replacing it in a couple of days. No, you need to have two at the minimum. But if you have two of these boxes and each box is only able to support 100,000 customers and you have 200,000 customers, it means you will need to have at least three boxes, probably four of them. So this is a very expensive technology. And again, it creates a lot of problems, not to mention that you will have more calls to your help desk, which also costs money. Now, there is one additional problem with carry ring net. One of them is when you use some IPv4 addresses in the carry ring net box, because you need to share the ports, there are service providers like, for example, OpenDNS or, for example, Sony, Network Play, uh, Sony PlayStation Network, PSN, I think is the name, that will block all your IPv4 addresses that are connected to carrier Renat boxes. They will put them in a blacklist and they will never clean those addresses from the blacklist. What that means, if you invest in carrier Renat, you will need to invest also in getting new IPv4 addresses because when Afrinic runs out, you cannot get more addresses from Afrinic and that basically means you need to go to the market to buy addresses. And addresses may cost even up to $25, $30 per address, depending on how many of them you buy. Okay? So investing in carry Reynat is the grown approach. It's cheaper to write invest in IPv4 addresses in that case. So you don't buy carry ring nut, you just buy the addresses. Because if you go and buy carry ring nut, sooner or later you will need to buy again more addresses. Of course, ideally, instead of that, you deploy IPv6. But you still need to have some addresses for keeping uh, IPv6 only with IPv4 as a service, as we will see in the next slides. Another difficulty when you are using carrier NAT is that because you are sharing addresses between different customers, if a customer is doing a criminal action, you cannot identify so easily which customer is the responsible for that. So you may need to invest in more complex and very expensive logging systems. Depending on what is the law in your country, you need to register so much data that maybe the logging system and the storage for the logging system is even more expensive than the carrier in that box. Okay? So, for example, Europol is uh, alerting to, to the European countries about this, telling them, look, you are sharing the same address as criminals. And of course, the problem is that judge will not give authorization in case of a criminal uh, case, they will not give authorization to investigate 60 people. They will ask the ASP, please tell me the exact data. Restrict the number of people. And for example, in some countries like Belgium, there is a voluntary decision of the ISPs to have a maximum of 16 people for every IP address. Okay, that's one possibility. 
But this is a voluntary action. There is no law today that mandates in every country in the world doing that. So in general, uh, Cargreen Nut has lots of disadvantages. I really, really, really think is the wrong approach. Now, we know all the situation is we don't have any more IPv4 addresses. Um, and uh, of course, dual stack seems to be the best solution, but dual stack means additional OPEX, additional CAPEX, less performance, efficiency, management uh, of two networks, and so on. So dual stack, even if it looks the easier way, is actually one uh, way very expensive. Again, because if you do dual stack and you want to keep everything in your network with dual stack, you will need to invest more and more in IPv4 addresses and maybe in carry green app. So, DS Light. DS Light is the first of these five transition technologies that Google talk about today. Dual stack light is a mechanism. Let me go straight to the picture. Dual stack light is a mechanism to have the CPEs connected to the ISP, which IPv6 only. Okay? So, of course, you need to upgrade or replace the CPEs but you don't need any more IPv4 addresses here. The customers still keep the possibility to, to have devices with dual stack. That's not a problem. If there is IPv6 traffic, which is the red line here, it will go straight to internet. But if there is IPv4 traffic, it will be encapsulated in IPv6 and will go through the FTR, the carrier green net. So again, with dual stack light, we still have the carry rate NAT, but the difference is that, as you can see here, we have, again, one level of NAT, only one level. So we just move the NAT from here to here, okay? But there is not two levels of NAT that will break a lot of applications. So this is probably one of the technologies that has got more usage in the few years when IPv6 only was started. Today is not the preferred technology, but there are still a lot of uh, CPEs that support this uh, technology. Um, I don't think it's the best one. We will see a comparison later with all the technologies, but it's one possibility. Next possibility, lightweight 4 over 6. Lightweight 4 over 6 is a simplification of DS light. Okay? So what we do is remember that in DS light we have the carry rain net box. And this is a very expensive box. So we were thinking, after some years of experience with DS light, why Can we don't go back, rethink again, and if we were doing the NAT in the CPE. Let's try to do again the NAT in the CP instead in, in the ISP network. And this is what it means lightweight 4 over 6. We put back the NAT functionality in the CPE. The CPE is still connected with IPv6 only to the ISP network. And then, instead of a carry green NAT, we have a lightweight carry green NAT that we call lightweight AFTR which needs less performance because it's not doing the translation, it's not doing the NAT functionality, okay? And the advantage of this is that it don't need a state. So lightweight IFTR is a more uh, cheaper box with exactly the same functionalities that DS Lite, okay? So obviously if you need to decide between DS Lite and Lightweight 4 over 6, the decision is clear, go for lightweight 4 over 6, no doubt. But there is, there is still some other technologies that we will talk about. You hear about NAT64 probably. Let me go again, straight to the, to the picture. NAT64, as the word says, is a technology to connect IPv6 only networks to IPv4 only networks. So what that means, is that with NAT64, you cannot support a customer that has IPv4-only devices. 
So this will not work while this situation where you have a device which is IPv6 only or a device which is IP dual stack, they will work. If there is an application in internet, for example, a website which is IPv6 enabled, of course, the traffic will go straight. If there is in internet some website, as many today still, that is IPv4 only, the NAS64 will do the translation. So the host here will get a fake quad A record from DNS. There is something called quad A record synthesis, and that will make the IPv4 address from the website here to be perceived by the host as it has a quad A record. So the traffic will go from IPv6 translated by the NAS64 to IPv4 and the same way, way back in the, in the opposite direction, okay? So again, we have still here a NAT. However, this NAT64 is less painful for applications and breaking less things that a regular NAT44, okay? So that's the big advantage. Now, the problem still is to make sure this works, applications need to support DNS. So if you have applications that are using embedded IPv4 literal addresses, they will not work. If you have applications that don't have DNS and you are typing the IPv4 address, they will not work. And of course, again, if you have IPv4 only applications or devices, they will not work. So as you can see, NAT64, it looks like a good advantage, but actually today is not a protocol that you can really deploy for normal customers. You will be able only to deploy this if your customers have everything in their, in their network supporting IPv6. That's the only way this will work. In fact, there is a study done by T-Mobile a few years ago where it lists some applications, some very common applications like Google Talk, Google Plus, Last.fm, Netflix, Skype, Spotify, that were not working with NAT64. Some of them has, have been fixed in the recent years, okay? But the solution at that time was what we call 464XLAT. 464XLAT is basically an optimization of NAT64. And the good thing about 464XLAT is that it solves all the problems for NAT64. So that means that applications like Skype that are embedding IPv4 literal addresses in the packets will still work, okay? Now, how 464XLAT works? Basically, what we have is still an NAT64 box. In the terminology for 464XLAT, this box is called PLAT, which stands for Provider Translator, okay? We have also the customer translator, which is called CLAT, and the CLAT is in the CPE of the customer. Uh, I see a question here. In NAT64 network, IPv4 only devices will reach the IPv4 content in the internet? No, because NAT64 only works having only IPv6 in one side and only IPv4 in the other side. So that's, again, the disadvantage of NAT64. Now, again, in 464XLAT, uh, we have the NAT64, which again is called, in this case, PLAT, but it's exactly the same, no difference in the functionality. And then we have one new functionality, which is CLAT. And CLAT start, stands for Customer Translator, okay? So what this means is that the CLAT is providing private IPv4 addresses in the LANs, okay? What that means is that we are solving the problem of IPv4-only devices. 
So the, the person that asked the question about if an at 64 IPv4 only devices will reach IPv4 contact, uh, content on internet, the answer again is not with NAT64, yes, with 464XLAT, okay? Uh, I, I, I see another question. So what is the use of having dual stack devices? I just responded to it because if you use 464XLAT, the dual stack devices will be able to reach both IPv4 and IPv6 or even IPv4 only devices like those here in the picture will be able to reach the content in the internet. Never mind this is IPv4 or IPv6. So the thing here is uh, we need one more function which is called DNS64. DNS64 is the function that I mentioned in the previous slide um, that is basically generating quad A records, so it means IPv6 uh, addresses for IPv4 only devices in internet. So which, if you have an IPv4 only website, it will not have a quad A record, but the DNS64 will create it. So, any IPv6 uh, device will be able to access that and even IPv4 devices will access that as well. The same person is saying, uh, I think it's the same person, so dual stack is useless in NAT64? Yes, basically NAT64 only works for IPv6 only devices, that's the thing. So the solution instead of NAS64 is using again 464XLAT. Now, what the 464XLAT is doing is IPv6 traffic is going straight, no translation, and IPv4 traffic is going either by means of a translation only in the NAS64 or a dual translation in both the CLAT, which is doing a NAT46 translation, and another translation in the NAS64. I think it's easier to understand that here in this picture, okay? So we have, let's suppose it's a cellular phone. The cellular phone will have dual stack inside, but the connection to the ISP network is IPv6 only. Obviously this means the ISP need less IPv4 addresses, okay? So there is no need typically to buy more addresses by using 464XLAT. So if we have an application inside of the cellular phone using IPv6 connecting to IPv6 server in internet, the traffic flow is a strike, no translation at all. While if we have an application that is using IPv4 inside the cellular phone, this application will need to be translated either at the PLAT, at the NAS64, or both at the CLAT and the PLAT. And to understand the difference between all the possible cases, you need to look into this picture. We have basically three possible situations. We have a situation where an application in the cellular phone or behind the CPE in a case of a residential network is using IPv6, connecting to an IPv6 host. It means everything is plain IPv6, no translation at all. Now, the second case is we have, for example, a web browser, which is dual stack, and is trying to connect to an IPv4 only server. In this case, because it's using DNS, the combination of DNS64 plus NAT64 will allow this host to go through from IPv6 to IPv4, okay? 
And finally, let's suppose you type in the browser or you configure the DNS for Google 8.8.8.8. .8 and that means in this case, we need to do two translations. We need to do a translation in the SILAT from IPv4 to IPv6 because the, IPv the, the ISP network is IPv6 only. And then at the end of the ISP network, we do again a translation from IPv6 to IPv4. So end to end is like if nothing happens. We have IPv4 at the beginning, we have IPv4 at the end, okay? Of course, all this is um, transparent for applications. It's the cellular phone operating system or it is the CPE what is doing the translation with the CELAT when it's needed. It's not always done. It's only done in some situations. Okay? Now, let's suppose you have CDNs in your network. If you have CDNs in the network and you have a smart TV or you have a set of box which is IPv4 only, what 464XLAT is going to do is translating twice as we just explained it. So it's doing a translation in the, in the CPE and it's doing a translation in the CLAT. Sorry, in the, in, the, in the PLAT, in the NAT64, okay? And of course, because dual stack, the CDNs today or the caches today, most of the time are dual stack. So what we are doing now in ITF, and this is not yet a standard, it's, it's a work that we just started about a few, few months ago, is to make sure that we can use the CLAT to keep it IPv6 up to the end. So that will be a further optimization of 464 x lat But again, this is work in progress. This is not yet a standard, okay? There is one more possible optimization, is that today there is not any transition mechanism that allow to have IPv6 only servers or services in internet be accessed by IPv4 only devices. So with this optimization that I just mentioned, we could do that as well, okay? Again, this is work in progress. It's just a picture of what comes next. And this is happening only with 464XLAT. There is a very interesting thing here to mention is that 464XLAT is the only transition mechanism supported in cellular networks. There is no support for any other transition mechanism. So if you have a cellular network, you have no other solution than going to 464XLAT. However, uh, if you um, have as well a broadband network, then the advantage of having 464XLAT is that you can use the same transition mechanism for both networks, okay? I just saw another question in the chat instead of the Q&A. Uh, I am going to respond it because it's, it's, it's very easy, even if it's not related to this slide. It's uh, with dual stack, the device uses less energy. I don't understand the relation between dual stack and the energy. Okay, let me explain because this is key for cellular networks especially. In cellular networks, when you have a NAT, the smartphone need to tell the NAT, the carry rate NAT actually, every 30 seconds, please keep the ports open for me. I am using these ports even there is no traffic right now. Otherwise, you cannot get incoming connections. You will not receive WhatsApp messages unless the cellular phone is sending keep alive every 30 seconds. So that means every 30 seconds, energy wasted and radio bandwidth wasted. I guess now it's, now it's clear. Okay, now let me skip this. You can see, you will receive a copy of the slides later on 
this is the step-by-step -step, uh, addressing translation from XLAT, but I think it's something that you can understand later on. Now, availability and deployment of, of uh, 464 XLAT, well, there are different components as we just explained it. We have NAT64 and most of the common vendors support NAT64 already. There is also open source. I am using typically for deployments, even big scale deployments for NAS64, an open source that is developed by Nick Mexico, which is called Joule. I think it's one of the best choices if you want to use open source uh, solutions for your NAS64. And then we have CLAT. CLAT is available already since many, many, many years ago in Android. Now it's also available for doing tethering in Apple, in iOS, uh, iPhones. And of course, you can do also CLAT with Joule. And if you know OpenWRT, which is an open source version of um, um, Linux for routers, um, you, you have as well support for CLAT. And regarding commercial deployments, uh, well, it's, it's very easy to, 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 to say that today, the transition technology that has more users in the world even if you put in the other side all the other transition technologies together, is 464 XLAT. So in my opinion, 464 XLAT is the best choice in every possible case, okay? Uh, some people may disagree, and in fact, we have two more transition mechanisms, IPv4 as a service, to explain. The first one is what we call MAP-E, or MAP encapsulation, um, map E uh, basically uh, what is doing is similar to lightweight 4 over 6. What is doing is replacing the carrier ring NAT, which what we call in this protocol border relay. We, we keep the NAT 44 in the CPE and the E stands for encapsulation. So it's just a tunneling of IPv4 on top of the IPv6 only network, okay? So this is map encapsulation. Again, very similar to lightweight 4 over 6. It has some difference in terms of how you approach the dressing plan, but in the rest, it has the same functionalities as lightweight 4 over 6. This is the packet flow for a map E Again, I am not going to go into the detail. You can check it later. Um, we have another version of MAP, which in this case is called MAP-T, and the T stands for translation. MAP-T is somehow similar to 464XLAT, but it makes the translation, the double translation, all the time. So it's not as sufficient and as 464XLAT. And again, instead of the carry ring NAT, we have here the border relay, which has a NAT64 functionality. And then we have at the CPE, two types of NAT. We have a NAT44 and also a NAT46. As you can see, if you compare this with 464XLAT, the difference is that you have more translations and always uh, being translated, okay? While in 464XLAT, it depends on if you have uh, DNS or not. So if you have DNS, only one translation is done. And if you have uh, literal addresses or all APIs, then you do two translations, but in MAPT, you always do both translations, okay? Uh, another difference between 464XLAT and bot map technologies is that in the NAT64, you need to keep a state, while in the border relay, you don't keep a state. However, that means that the addressing plan is somehow done automatically for you by the map protocol. And some people may believe this is good, but actually this is very bad because you are losing the control of your addressing plan. 
So in my opinion, map are not better than 464XLAT. And again, map is not supported in cellular networks. So you only have one choice if you have a cellular network, which is 464XLAT. And of course, if I have a cellular network and a broadband network, I will probably prefer to have a single transition mechanism for both networks. For example, let's suppose you have a CPE that connects your customers with, with uh, GPON or DSL, and you offer also a USB stick with a 3G link. Obviously, the ideal situation is that if the DSL link goes down, you are still using the same transition mechanism in the 3G link, okay? So that's one more reason for choosing 464XLAT compared with the other uh, protocols. Again, the MAPT packet path, I am not going through it. Uh, quick comparison between MAPE uh, and MAPT. Well, MAPT is using encapsulation. So it means it needs additional 20 bytes for the encapsulation of IPv4 and IPv6. Okay, so that's the, that's the main difference between the two protocols. Uh, MAP is, it has more complexity. Now, MAP protocols, even if they are ITF protocols, uh, part of the, of the people that developed those protocols is Cisco. So Cisco offer a tool to do your addressing plan based, based on, on, the, on the MAP uh, protocol. Another interesting thing, uh, which in my opinion is, is, is bad, and this happens uh, both in DS Lite, Lightwave 4 over 6, Map E, and Map T, is that you need to decide how many ports you allocate to every customer. And I don't think that's good, because some customers need just 300 ports, but some other customers, for example, gamers, may need 5,000, 6,000 ports. Okay? So if you decide to use, let's suppose, 30 customers per IPv4 address, which means 2,000 ports for each customer, some customers will complain and will call the help desk because they will not get sufficient ports. Now, during the few years, the last few years, I have been working in trying to compare all the possible transition mechanisms. This table is generic. It means it's not uh, a, a rule for every network. You need to adjust this table for studying what is the best transition technology for your own network, okay? This is very, very important. Don't believe this is uh, a white paper that applied to every network because in some networks, for example, overhead may be important, but in other networks, the CP update is another problem or maybe scalability or performance or the support for LLGs or how you aggregate IPv6 or how much impact in logging. So depending on that, I am using a, a color scheme similar to traffic light. So green means good, positive. So I am scoring it as one. Orange means in the average. So I am scoring as half point. And red, it means negative. So I am scoring a zero. So when you compare all the possible transition mechanisms, even some of them, which I didn't mention here, the best one will be 6RD. But 6RD, which is getting the higher score, requires IPv4 public addresses for every customer. And that's the problem we have. We don't have any more IPv4 addresses. Okay? Um, so the alternative, is looking to all the others, and you can see that if we compare 464XLAT, for example, with MAP T, they are very, very close in the scoring. However, if you need to have support now or in the future for cellular networks, you can see that MAP don't support cellular networks. So clearly, you will go for 464XLAT, okay? So this is, this is the, the, the key thing. This is the key decision. Uh, 
I see some questions here. Let's try to answer them. Is random combination of CLAT, PLAT, and NAS64 technologies okay? I'm not sure to understand the question. I am trying to answer anyway. Uh, PLAT is the same as NAT64. It's just a terminology change, okay? So don't get confused. PLAT and NAT64 is the same. PLAT is the part presented um, in the ISP, okay? While CLAT is the customer translator, which is either in the cellular phone or is in the CPE. So you need to combine both of them. You need to combine the CLAT in the CPEs and the PLAT in the provider. That's it. I see somebody mentioned we don't have IPv4 in Afrinic. Yeah, well, it's not just Afrinic. It's everybody in the world don't have any more IPv4. So I agree, it's time to come. Uh, there is a comment here out of the products you listed. I'm not sure what, what is the question there. So if you can rephrase it, I will be happy to, to answer it. Okay, so let's keep going. I just mentioned already about the number of ports per user. Again, in the technologies that use uh, port sharing, like MAPT, MAPE, uh, DS Lite, and uh, Lightwave for over six, you need to define how many ports you want to use per user. There are some property solutions that don't need that, but in general, you need to fix how many ports per user. Today, in a typical family, if you have a CPE and you have, for example, five people in the family, you will need at least 300 ports per user behind the CPE. So that means 1,500 ports for a, five, uh, for a family of five, okay? But this is if the family has only one device every member. Today it's common that you have a tablet, a cellular phone, maybe a laptop. So you may need to multiply that for more uh, in, in case you have more, more devices behind the CP. And in addition to that, this is a typical use. But if you use applications that, that are using uh, many ports like Ajax-based applications, and that's a very well-known uh, Google Maps, when you reach the number of ports, you will get white boxes in the screen, okay? So this is the result of having not sufficient ports. Of course, in this application, you can see the result. In some other applications, they just don't work. You will not get an error or anything. They will time out, okay? So it's very, very relevant that you make sure um, to have sufficient ports per user. And the best way to do that is not restrict the number of ports, and that's what NAT64 is allowing. In the case of NAT64, the number of ports is dynamically allocated depending on the usage, on the fly. Now, I already mentioned this. Uh, there was a presentation, I think about one year ago, in, uh, in Australia from, uh, from a, a, an ISP that was saying, hey, I saved so much money because I buy category net boxes. Well, when you ask them how many addresses they have, they already added also some additional IP for addresses, and they don't realize that when they uh, th those addresses get blocked in the in the blacklist from from Sony PlayStation and other providers, service providers. They will need to buy new addresses. So what they believe now is saving money. Actually, they are investing in the wrong way because they will need to buy again the same number of IPv4 addresses every couple of years or so. Okay, so please don't go for carrying at do a better investment, go straight to IPv6 only with IPv4 as a service. It's a much better investment, even if you believe it's more complex, it's a longer term solution. It's not just a, a, a short term one. 
Now I have some documents uh, for further reading. Um, the, 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 the first document is RFC 7084. This document is talking about what the CPEs should, should, should support for IPv6 only which IPv4 as a service, but this document, which is a bit old, is, I think is from 2013, uh, didn't come with the newer uh, transition technologies that we mentioned today. So two weeks ago, finally, after three years of work, I got published a new RFC, which is 8585, and this RFC is precisely supporting all the transition technologies that we mentioned today. So when you buy new CPEs, when you talk to your vendors about new CPEs, please make sure to state, I need the CPE to support RFC 8585. There is another document that hopefully in about two or three months will become an RFC as well. And this is draft ITF V6 Ops NAT64 deployment, okay? So this document is right now in the last call. I think it passed the last call, so it's going to be published, as I just said, maybe in three, four months. Um, this document is actually explaining all the details you need to know for both a cellular or broadband operator in order to deploy 464X LAT or NAT64, okay? There are a couple of documents that I recommend reading. One of them is explaining about how you do point-to-point -point links. Uh, and another one is RIPE 690, which is a best current operational practices, which explains what is the best recommendations about providing addresses for your residential customers. In short, this document is recommending that every residential customer must have a slash 48, and that those prefixes are persistent. In IPv4, we typically change the address for the customer every few days. This is wrong for IPv6. It has many implications. So please don't do that. Please go to read RIPE 690. DNS set considerations. Okay. Let me try to explain this. DNS 64, as I explained it before, is creating fake quad A records for hosts that have only an A record. So a server, for example, a web server in internet that is connected only with IPv4 will not have a quad A record. So it will not be accessible from an IPv6 only network. But what DNS64 is doing is creating this quad A record with a special prefix, okay? Which is the NAT64 prefix. The result of that is it works, but if the end host is doing DNSSEC validation, it may break it. It's not always getting break, broken. In fact, we believe that it's breaking only 1.7% of the cases. But the advantage is that if you have 464X LAT, you don't need to use the NS64. 464X LAT still works without the NS64. If you use NAT64 alone, you are mandated to use the NS64. But in the case, in the case of 464XLAT, you can just have NAT64, you can have the CLAT, and no need for the DNS64. So this is one more advantage of 464XLAT, okay? In cellular networks, operators believe that this is not a problem, but actually it is, because even if the cellular phone is not doing DNSSEC validation, 
there may be devices or applications behind the cellular phone, for example, when you use tethering, that may be using validation. So by using a SILAT without DMS64, uh, you solve the problem. One example of this is Orange in Poland. They deploy it for 64X LAT without DNS64. In other cases, they decided to go to, to DNS64, but in Orange in Poland decided not to go and they have less troubles in the HAL desk, okay? So again, in the document I explained it in the previous slide, let me go back. This document here, NAS64 deployment guidelines, okay? This document explains, again, this document explains all these details. It's a long document, it's about 40 something pages, but I really, really recommend reading it, okay? Now, I already explained it about this. Just, I want to insist a bit more because it's really, really, really important. Don't get wrong. You can use 6RD, you can use DS Lite, you can use MAP, you can use whatever you want in the broadband network, but in the cellular network, you only have one choice, which is 464X LAT, okay? So make sure to consider 464X LAT also for your broadband, because if you have two types of networks, broadband and cellular, you will have to manage two different transition mechanisms. And that's probably not a smart solution. Another interesting thing, and this is only for those of you that, that already have some notions of, of cellular networks. In the cellular networks, you, need, you have something called a PDP context. And the PDP context can be IPv4 only, IPv6 only, or dual stack, which is IPv4 v6. As more PDP context you have, as more ATNs, which is the connection point from the cellular uh, phone to the network, you pay more in licenses. If you have a single APN, and this is only possible with 464X LAT, you are going to support all kinds of devices, even older devices that have IPv4 only, and you don't need to pay in extra licenses, okay? So this is automatically supported if you use 464X LAT, but it's not if you are using uh, any other protocol or if you are using dual stack, which is the other alternative for cellular networks. You cannot use any other transition mechanism either dual stack or 464X LAT. And again, to use dual stack, you need a lot of IPv4 addresses or you need to use carry green NAT. Tethering. How is tethering done in cellular networks? Basically, what you do is you extend the IPv6, uh, I think there is, sorry, here. You need to extend the slash 64, which is the prefix that is allocated by default to every PDP context, okay? So by extending the slash 64, you provide access not just to the cellular phone, but also to devices that are being tethered by the cellular phone, okay? So somehow the cellular phone becomes at the same time a host and a router. And then this slash 64 prefix, which is the default prefix for every IPv6 uh, subnet or LAN, um, gets used also for other devices in that uh, tethering network or tethered network. Now, one thing that many people don't know, while it's true that in theory IPv6 may be a little bit slower than IPv4, in fact, in a local area network, if you use Ethernet, maybe two or three percent is lower, but in the reality, 
because the use of NAT IPv4 is getting slower and slower compared to IPv6. So today for both uh, iPhone and Android, IPv6 is 40% faster to complete as HTTP GET, okay? So what that means? Basically, it means that users get a better perception of quality of service with an IPv6 network. This data is being reported by Facebook already a few years ago. Now it's being reported by content delivery networks. And the reason is very simple to explain. First, the use of NAT in IPv4. Second, because more and more big hosting services, even uh, big companies like Facebook, YouTube, Google, et cetera, et cetera, they have in their data centers only IPv6. They don't have any more IPv4 in their data centers. So when you reach the data center for Facebook, it means that there is a gateway, there is a proxy in front of their data centers in such a way that if you go to the data center with IPv4, you will get translated to IPv6 inside of the data center. Of course, if you are using already in your smartphone IPv6, there is no translation end-to-end, -end. okay? Okay, I got again the same question about the energy. Let me explain again. Uh, if not, we can talk offline. If you have a, a, a dual stack device, it's not because the dual stack, it's because the IPv4, which IPv4 you have NAT. If you have a NAT with your IPv4 cellular device, to keep the ports open to allow incoming connections, the smartphone need to tell the network, the NAT in the network, every 30 seconds, please keep the NAT ports open for me. Okay? So that means every 30 seconds, there is something called keep alive messages that go to that network. Okay? I hope you got it now. Uh, so again, if you have IPv6 only, you have end-to-end -end connection with IPv6 without translation. While if you are using IPv4, you have probably more than two NAT translations in the middle. And that means an impact up to 40%, okay? So that's very, very relevant in terms of quality of service. And I think this is my final slide. Um, I think I, I went too fast because usually I do this in, in about uh, one hour and a half, but this is good because we can even jump to some other slides or we can answer more questions. Um, if you have a multi-service network, if you are an ISP that have residential customers, if you have an ISP, uh, sorry, you have also corporate, net, uh, uh, corporate customers, if you have also cellular customers, definitively the best solution is using 464 XLAT. Okay? That's basically the, the conclusion. So, how we are going with the time? I think we are 15 minutes. Okay, I got a question here. Let's go for questions. To add on the reasons why people should avoid using CGNAT. Yeah, if you use CGNAT, you need to buy from time to time IPv4 addresses. That's one thing. So it gets more and more expensive. Second thing is you are breaking a lot of applications. So it means you will need to deploy application layer gateways, which means that your carrier in NAT will scale less and less. Okay, so we'll, you will invest in more carrier in NAT boxes.
Exactly. You can get now still some addresses in Afrinic if you justify uh, the need. But I guess this this will be uh, ending up in a few months. I don't know. I don't remember right now the the figures of of available IPv4 addresses in in uh, in Afrinic. But this not is this is, this is not going to last forever for sure. In the other regions, we, we, we are already in the last phase. So in the other regions, the maximum you can get is as last 22. And only if you are a newcomer, if you have an existing network, if you are already member of Afrinic or, or another registry, you will not be able to get more addresses. Additional questions? I can jump quickly to some other slides I have. Uh, this is an example configuration of a lab that I do some, sometimes. Um, I think we are going to do this in the next Afrinic meeting. So please come to Uganda for, for the next uh, Afrinic and we will do a hands-on on, on this uh, uh, workshop. So not just the, the slides, but you will actually implement your own NAT64, your, no, your own CLAT using open source. I do that using what we call JUL. Let me skip some of the slides and let me talk about this. Data centers without IPv4. This is a protocol which is somehow complementary with 464X LAT, which um, means you can have data centers which IPv6 only and still be available to be reachable by networks that IPv4 only. So let me go straight to the picture. So this is the idea. You have a data center. Inside the data center, you have only IPv6, but in the border, we have what we call the CDC border relay. And that means that you can get connections from, of course, internet with IPv6, but also from devices that are IPv4 only, okay? I see, okay. I see one, one person asking me about the comparison between, let me go there. I think is this one. I guess that's the that's the slide that Lauren is referring. No, I didn't perform it an analysis. Uh, basically, most of the vendors they provide their own figures about how they perform, which 464x LAT or other protocols. But the point is that these figures also depend on on each model. So it's not the same using, for example, a Cisco ASA than another box, okay? So the performance depends not only in the vendor, but also in the specific box. Uh, I am recommending in general using open source instead of boxes for this functionality. And we didn't got any problems even with tens of thousands of users in a single NAT64 uh, box using uh, Ubuntu and Joule. Security considerations. Yes, uh, while well the, the, the presentation, I didn't mention the, the security considerations because basically they are very, very close from all the transition mechanisms and are not really related to the transition itself. They are most related to on one side IPv4, on the other side IPv6. So when I explain, when I do a, a workshop for transition, uh, I always refer to the security considerations for both IPv4 and IPv6. And of course, uh, you should not allow, um, let's say, to have transition mechanisms in a network if you don't have control on it. Because that means that users can escape of the security mechanism. So any ISP deploying IPv6 
should make sure to have security at the same level from IPv4 to IPv6. There are differences, but basically it's about the same. Functionality of the translator in dual Slack. Okay. In dual stack, you don't need a translator, okay? You need the translator if you are doing uh, IPv6 only deployment. You will need a translator if both sides of the picture are using different protocols. So the translator is not really depending on the dual stack, um, but more about how you deploy the network and what transition you are using. Percentage of data centers being deployed in IPv6 only. Well, uh, I don't have that figure, but I can tell you that Facebook has 100% of the data centers which IPv6 only. I believe other companies like LinkedIn, uh, um, Yahoo, um, of course, YouTube, Google are doing the same, but I don't have exact figures about how much is that. Five minutes to go. Any additional questions? Anything from, from Afrinic? Any question from Afrinic? So I guess that's it. If there is no additional questions, again, uh, let me put my last slide so you have my contact details. Okay, I went too fast. You have my contact details here. Uh, what prefix to use with 464XLAT? I suggest you read the document from ITF that I mentioned, guidelines for a, a NAT64 deployment. There are two ways of deploying 464XLAT. One is using what we call the well-known prefix, and the other one is network-specific prefix. I, I really suggest you read that part of the document, or even better, read the full document, provide inputs, um, because it's, it's not easy to respond to that question now. It, it's very specific to the network. Final question, any? Yeah, the slide set, I already provided it to, to Afrinix, so they will, they will publish it somehow uh, later on, I guess. So if no more questions, thank you very much. And see you in Uganda. Thank you. Thank you everyone for IPv6 deployment assistance from Afrinic. I've posted the link on the chat. You can use that link to get assistance from us in deploying IPv6. The materials will be shared later. That includes the slides and also the link to the video. Also, if you're in Nairobi, we're going to be having a deployathon. I'll also share a link which you can use to register. Thank you, guys. See you in Uganda. Bye-bye. Thank you, Jody. Thank you. Bye.